Last weekend, we took the weekend off, and I went to, uh, we were up in Big Bear, looking around and hanging out up there for a few hours, and we went into the store, and I saw this plaque, and it had a little sign, a little sign and it said, a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. And that really, that really hit home with me. And I realized later who said it. It was Charles Spurgeon, an old Baptist preacher from the 19th century from England. But if you think about that for a minute, that really does hit home. Because you see, sometimes you go to these churches and you see these people that have been following God for a long time. They'll whip that Bible out and it'll look like it's been through the war. Pages will be falling apart. It'll, the binding will be all broken down. In fact, I remember seeing someone the other day that where I work, a customer came in and they're Christians and they gave me this little paperback Bible that someone had given them. And we get to talking about Jesus every now and then here and there. And, and uh, the guy pulled out his Bible and it was just almost destroyed. The pages were all worn and he had it marked all over the place. He had notes here, notes there, and his wife said, I bought him a new one, but he always comes back to this old one. And I said, well, I know why. It's because he has it all marked up. You know how long it would take to mark up that new one? But the reason why the person isn't falling apart is because everybody that has read their Bible and read it a lot knows that it is a storehouse of treasure. Is that, can I get an amen on that? It is a storehouse of treasure. Even, even if you just read, you've, and I know everybody's heard this, even if you just read Proverbs, a proverb a day, you can read one a month on the average. And my favorite proverb is this. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, I don't always have the ability to follow that, but I will say that that is very good advice. Because sometimes you hear people talking and then they jump right in there before they're finished talking and you interrupt them. But wait a minute. And you didn't let them make their point. And if you just read those Proverbs and apply them to your life, you'll see that they, in general, they work. Because it's good advice, is it not? And the Bible's like that. And what's really interesting is we can learn from other people's mistakes. We can look and see what other people have did, how they have fallen, and, and the areas that they failed in, and we can learn from what they had failed to do. And how many know that it's easier to learn from what someone else has failed than it is to learn the hard way and have to go through it yourself? Isn't it easier to realize that you can turn things around without having to do it the hard way? But some of us are stubborn. I was like that in my younger years. I had to learn the hard way. But I will say this. When you do, you never forget it. I want to take you in the, in the book of John in chapter 11 this morning. I want to talk about something here for a few minutes. Most of you know what we're talking about here already. It's about Lazarus. What's interesting about Jesus is when you get to the point where you think that you can't go on or you think that the absolute worst has happened and there couldn't possibly be a way out, He delivers you again. And you realize when you followed Him for a long time that virtually nothing is impossible for our God. Now it starts out in verse 1. It says, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, a village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So her sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, for a second here, I want to point out something about this. They knew Jesus. He was a, a friend of theirs. And their brother is now sick. And it's unto death. He's going to die. So they say, I want you guys to go get Jesus. And I want you to bring him back here. Because I know, without a doubt, 
he can heal our brother. So you've got to get going and you've got to go find him and get him back here before Lazarus dies. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Verse 5 says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now remember, the sister sent word to Jesus that their brother was sick. And when you read it, there was a sense of urgency. You've got to get there, and you've got to get Jesus, and you've got to get him back here because Lazarus is sick. And they had an enormous amount of faith to the point that there was, they believed without a doubt that he could have healed them. When he got word to him, he waited two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered, are there, yet, <clears throat> are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep but I'm going to go there to wake him up. Now, of course, we know the story. Lazarus actually died. Now, you can imagine what the sisters might be going through at this time. Having sent word to Jesus with this urgency, get him back here because we've got to get him to, wake, we got to, get him to heal Lazarus. So you can imagine how they felt when Jesus didn't make it back in time. Verse 12 says, The disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. But Jesus was speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he talked about or meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. Why would he say that? Because if he would have been there, he would have probably healed him. And you're thinking, wait a minute. Why wouldn't he want to heal him? But he says, I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there. So you may believe. Well, believe what? So at this point, they don't fully understand what's going on either. First he says, well, Lazarus is asleep. And then he says, look, guys, you don't get it. He's dead. But I'm glad I wasn't there. That's talking about the time he was sick. For your sake. So that you may believe. Well, everybody in this story seems like believed that Jesus was able, without a doubt, to heal Lazarus who was sick. Because Jesus had already made a name for himself by opening deaf ears, opening blind eyes, making the lame walk, and totally just bewildering the people when they saw this. Could you imagine for a minute, could you imagine knowing someone that's blind, knowing without a doubt they're blind, they can't see, and this guy comes along and opens their eyes? Could you imagine what that would be like to see something like that? So these people knew that Jesus could do these things. But there's something about death being final. It's like, well, he's gone, so it's too late. So anyway, in verse 17, it says, On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Okay, he's been dead for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. So Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. 
And Martha said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So she believed that in the resurrection her brother would, would rise again. She believed that also. But Jesus went on in verse 25 to say, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly, went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, and you can guess what she said. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Everybody in unison believed that if he would have just got there before Lazarus would have died, he could have healed him. But what did he tell his disciples? He said, I am glad I wasn't there for your sake. In other words, I wasn't there and he died. Because, obviously, he's got something else in mind. Verse 38 says, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb in the cave where a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time... There is a bad odor, for he has been dead for four days. Now, I want you to think about something else here real quick. When, you, when someone dies, decomposition starts. So he's been decomposing for four days, along with everything else. So not only does Jesus have to raise him up, he's got to put him back together. Four days of decomp is probably, I, I don't know how fast they advance, but... Four days, a lot can happen. So then Jesus said, verse 40, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you have always heard me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe you sent me. Referring to what he's about ready to do. When he had said this, he called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off his grave clothes and let him go. Wow. So it's obvious by delaying and letting Lazarus die, it's obvious he had something else in mind. When they saw that someone that had been dead for four days came out of that tomb alive, you could only imagine how much their faith grew when they saw that even death couldn't lay hold of a person. Even death has been conquered through our Savior, Jesus. So now when he says, when he says, you will rise again, he proved it by raising people from the dead. So these people, their faith grew enormously because they thought it was the end of something when God had something else in mind altogether. We don't always know what he's going to do tomorrow. We don't know what exists tomorrow. He does. 
And sometimes we can look at situations that we are in at this present time and we might think there's no hope or there's no way out. But yet, time and time again, you can ask anybody that's followed Jesus for decades, time and time again, when you think there's no other way, He provides one. And death is something that people think that they look at as being final. But for those that follow Jesus, death isn't the end, it's the beginning. Mary and Martha had put all their faith in this man Jesus. And he had done something to increase their faith. Even when she thought by letting him die it wasn't God's will to heal him, she still said, whatever you ask God, I know he'll do. So I want to go over to Matthew chapter 7 for a moment. Getting back to that getting back to that that Bible again. We can find answers to just about anything in this life in this book. And it's very important to know and understand God's Word. But even more so, it's, it's very important to apply His Word to our lives. Jesus himself said that the robe was narrow. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said this, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had a foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. So just like those Proverbs we talked about earlier, you know, Proverbs is just good advice. A soft answer turns away wrath, as one of the Proverbs says. Is that always true? No, it's not always. Sometimes you can answer softly and there'll still be wrath. But as a general rule, it does. So the point is, is if we can apply this word to our lives, we'll see how it does work. And like that old saying, when, a Bible, when you see a Bible that's falling apart, it usually belongs to someone who isn't. The reason why is they've spent a long time in this book and they've heeded the words of Jesus and they applied these words to their life. And by applying these words to their life, it makes them able to cope through this life and to endure this life. And not only that, but be a light to others around you that Jesus had delivered you, he can deliver them also. So the question is, is just like he raised the dead man, Lazarus, is he going to be able to raise us up in the last day? Yes, he can, and he proved he could by raising someone from the dead. And then he says here in Matthew 7, if you hear these words of mine and you put them into practice, you'll be like a man that built his house on the rock. And everybody knows that rock is much more strong, stronger than sand. Sand isn't a sure foundation, is it? So it's obeying Jesus that keeps us on this narrow road. And there's so many things that can come along in our life that will lead us in the wrong direction and take us off that narrow path. So if we stray away from keeping these words in our heart, then we'll fall for just about anything that comes along. I got to tell you something. Before I came to God about, I don't know, 27, 28 years ago, before I came to God, I actually went to a fortune teller. This was when I was probably 21, 22 years. I was younger, a lot younger than my son. I went to a fortune teller because I was a young kid. I was all messed up, didn't know anything about life. I was young, ignorant, naive, whatever you want to call it. And I went to this fortune teller and she told me things about my life. And I'm just like, what? How could she know these things? And after she dazzled me with all this, then she told me about my future. 
100% of everything that woman told me about my future was wrong. But before all this took place, before all this took place, I remember thinking to myself, because she dazzled me, because she knew things that I knew she couldn't possibly understand, she, she could know, I was dazzled by this. I thought, I actually thought at the time that, wow, she must really be of God. Well, when I, when I found Jesus and I began to learn his word, I realized that that wasn't so. <laughs> the point is, is I, ha I didn't have anything to guide me except the people around me, which were just as naive and stupid as I was. They didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. So I took advice from dumb people. And I applied advice I got from dumb people to my life, and I found out the results were just as dumb as the advice I got. And until I came to Jesus and I started reading His Word, then I thought, wait a minute. You know, and I started, you know, you hear these little sayings through life, and, and you find, wow, that came from the Bible. I didn't know that. They actually took that from the Bible. Like, man can't live by bread alone. Well, gee, I remember reading that the first time in the Bible. Wow, that's where that came from. The Bible radically changed my thinking. And I began to see things in here, and I began to apply those things to my life, and I found out, unlike the stupid advice I got from these people around me when I was younger, I followed this book and did what it said, and you know what I found out? It works. It works. It doesn't mean that your life's perfect, it doesn't mean that you never fall down. It doesn't mean that you never fall short. But it does mean that you have a Savior that will lead you and guide you if you just put your trust in Him, even though you don't always understand what you might be going through, you can understand this. He is in control. And I remember talking to people here and there about how things are going in America, about how people are continuously turning away from God. They're turning away from the Bible. They're turning away from church. And if you really want to start a fight, you just mention the name of Jesus. And you'll start one. But, this book, when you apply it to your life, it works. And I learned that. When I first started getting an understanding of what the Bible says, I thought, wow. But anyway, back to what I was talking about. I forgot what I was going to say. That's why I had to move on to something else. I'm getting old. I'm forgetful. When you look at how bad things might be getting in the country, I remember telling people, we talk about these things like other church people, and I tell them this. I say, even though things are the way they are, I know who's really in charge, and that's Jesus. And you know, in America, things might be going in one direction, but do you know in other parts of the world, the gospel is exploding? How many of you know that when all this started out, you read in the Old Testament, God dealt with one nation of people. It's like the entire world were heathens. And then God chose one man named Abraham and called him. And his offspring, God revealed himself to him and his offspring and dealt with this one nation. And they had the responsibility of being a light to all those around them. You guys familiar with that? And they went through an enormous amount of trials, troubles, turmoil. Some of it they brought on themselves, some of it they didn't. But God picked one nation out of the world to be a light to others around them. The problem is they failed to do what God wanted them to do. Now, today, it doesn't depend on one nation. It's a global thing. If the United States and England and Australia and any other nation wholly turn their back on God, there is still somebody somewhere in this world that will follow Him and serve Him and spread that gospel. And you know what? I hear that missionaries are actually coming to America now. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, when he was dealing with Israel, they were just getting ready. They, they spent 40 years dwelling in the wilderness. And they spent 40 years because of disobedience. They 
were delivered out of Egypt. And when you go through and read the story of Exodus and you see the miraculous things that God did to bring His people out of this land and out of this bondage, and you see what He did to the nation of Egypt, it's just mind-boggling. But the final outcome was they were delivered. And in the book of Numbers, there's a story where Moses said, I want you to take 12 people, one from each tribe, and I want you to go in and I want you to spy out the land and come back and give us a report. So 12 people, one from each tribe of Israel, went into the land and they spied it out and they come back and they said, man, let me tell you, it truly is a land that flows with milk and honey. It, wow, they, got, they carried these... They carried this cluster of grapes back, and it was so big, it had to be carried on the shoulders of two people. Huge. And they come back, and they told about the crops and all this other things. That Man, it's awesome. This land that God wants to give us is just amazing. However, the people that live there are giants. We look like grasshoppers in their sight. Now, this is the people that crossed a, a, a sea on dry ground that saw ten plagues come on a nation, yet they weren't harmed. They saw deliverance come in a miraculous way. And these same people said, we can't do this because there's no way we could fight against these people over there. They'll murder us. And then when Joshua said, look, let's go because God's going to deliver this land into our hands. Uh-uh. They wanted to stone Joshua because he wanted to go. And they had forgotten about all the things that God had done previously. They didn't learn from the things that God had taught them earlier. So, the outcome was, they had to wait until everyone 20 years old and upward died. He said, those kids that you're worried about them taking away from you are going to go into this land that I promised, but they're not going to be able to go until the last one of you have dropped dead in this desert. So because of their disobedience, and by the way, you think, how, you, you might be thinking, well, why in the world would God be so mean to these people? Because He delivered them out of a bondage. And He called them to the foot of that mountain. And you know what they said? Do you know what they said? Whatever God says to do, will do. So they obligated themselves to follow this God and said they would obey Him. And they went back on their word. And guess what? They paid dearly for it. They knew the word. They knew what God wanted without a doubt. Yet they disobeyed Him and suffered for it. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, the 40 years has now been passed and the generation next to them is getting ready to go into the promised land. And Moses tells them, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and dries up before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, and all the Mites, and when the Lord has delivered you over and you have defeated them, you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Now once again, you got a generation told to do something. When you get over there, this is what I want you to do. And this is what I don't want you to do. Okay? Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. Down in verse 16, he told them again not to serve their gods because it would be a snare to them. It's going to cause you to fall. It's going to bring you destruction. Well, guess what? The same thing happens today if we don't follow the advice Jesus gave. What did we just read a few minutes ago? He that hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, I'll liken him to a man who built his house on the what? Rock. Because he gave heed to my words, because my words will bring you life. But if you disobey my words, the only result will be what? Death. Now you got to, it's the same thing that they went through back there. It's a picture of what we see today. 
This was that land that God had promised to give them when they carried the big clusters of grapes across, when they said, man, it's food over there. And he also told them, when you go over there, you're going to live in houses you didn't build. You're going to eat from vines that you didn't plant. You're going to be living off what somebody else labored. So after they finished wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, now it was time to go in and take possession of this land. In the book of Joshua, it talks about entering the land and conquering it. And when Joshua, Joshua was the successor to Moses, when he went into the land, when Israel came, when these people heard that Israel's coming, they trembled with fear because God was with them. How many of you know that God, if he wanted to, he could raise up a small nation that everybody think is in, would think is insignificant. He could take a small nation and take that nation and conquer a superpower if that's what he wanted to do. So do you think America is immune from God's judgment? No. If America continues to turn its back on God, history is going to repeat itself, I believe, eventually. If we don't repent as a nation. So during the book of Joshua, they went continuously taking land after land after land. And by the way, if any of you think it's horrible for God to do such a thing, to just come in and pick on these poor people and throw them out, the Bible talks about the people that lived in that land for hundreds of years. He said even Abraham was told that he was waiting for sin to reach its fullness. Did you know that the people that lived there that Israel drove out, God drove them out because of their wickedness? Y'all know that? And what did he tell Israel? He said, if you guys do the same thing, guess what? I'm going to drive you out. So it's all about, it's two things really. It's knowing His Word and applying it to your life and doing it. So, during, all through the book of Joshua, we see conquering going on. He's evicting these wicked people from the land. But the problem is Joshua didn't live long enough to evict all of them. And not only that, there's a scripture, I didn't look up where it is, but it talks about the people weren't numerous enough if they drove all the people out, the land would be too much of a wilderness and the wild animals would come in and, and, and be a problem. So the couple of reasons why he, didn't, he wasn't able to drive them all out. So all the days of Joshua, they followed God and they were obedient to Him and did what God wanted them to do because they had a leader that was righteous and followed God. And they followed His example. But then Joshua died at the age of 110 and we come to the story of Judges. And in chapter 2, verse 8, it says this, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land of his inheritance at timnath Heres in the hill country of Etham, or Ephraim, north of Gaash. After that, whole generation had been gathered to their fathers. Another generation grew up. In other words, the entire generation that came through the book of Joshua and occupied the land was now dead. These were the people that knew war, how to fight, and how to go in and take possession of the land as God had ordered them to do. But now their offspring had grown up, another generation, it goes on to say, who knew neither the Lord nor what He had done for Israel. Then the Israelites, notice they didn't know the Lord. Then the Israelites, in verse 11, did evil in the, in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the people around them. They provoked the Lord to anger. Today, we have the same kind of problems going on. We, might have, we have people that either don't know the Lord or they profess Him and still don't know Him. Why? Because a lot of people don't read their Bibles. They don't know how to get to know Jesus. A large percentage of professing Christians don't even go to church. They're like I was, if you stop and think about it for a minute. If you don't read your Bible and you don't go to church, sometimes going to church ain't enough. You still got to read your Bible. But people today are in the same position I was before I came to God because I didn't know the Bible. And because I didn't know the Bible, guess what? I fell for every stupid thing that came along. And guess what? You've got people today 
If they don't read their Bible and they don't understand and they don't go to a church that preaches the Scripture, guess what? They're going to be where I was. They're going to be believing every stupid thing that comes along. You read some dumb story on the internet, wow, there really are more roads to heaven than just one. This guy said so. And like they say, you can believe everything you read on the internet, right? So there are, all roads lead to heaven. Well, no, they don't. But you're going to believe that if you don't know the Bible. And remember, Jesus said, He that hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. Come on, you guys know that verse. Another interesting verse that Jesus said, He said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. You know, He said a lot of things that got him in the hot seat, didn't He? Now, in Jesus' day, I want you to picture this for a minute, if you will. In Jesus' day, a lot of Jews came to him, okay? But they came to him at the risk of losing their families. You might have had a guy from a Jewish family, and he follows this guy, Jesus, and he's, wow, this, this is interesting, his teachings are. And finally, he says, you know, I've got to follow this man because what he's saying is true. And they end up becoming a follower of Jesus. And he says, Dad, I've got to go follow this guy, Jesus. And the dad says, you know what? If you follow Jesus, you can forget that I'm your father. And by the way, your brother feels the same way. And your sisters, all 12 of them. Or, and your mother. If you stick with Jesus, you can forget about your family because we're not going to want anything to do with you. We're Jews and we think this guy's crazy. And if you follow him, you're not our kid anymore. So then, he got, then you got a choice to make. Do I follow this man, Jesus? Or do I forsake Jesus and go back to my family? But Jesus said... I mean, he didn't say literally hate your father. It's love your father less than Jesus. Are you willing to give up even your own family to follow Christ? Jesus said, if you don't, you can't be my disciple. You can't even let family stand in the way. And then he goes on, he says, and any one of you who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. In the days of Rome, when someone was crucified, they were forced to carry their own cross. It was a sign of submission. And you can imagine if somebody was rebellious enough to say, you know what, I ain't carrying my cross. Those Roman soldiers would have eaten that up. Oh, you don't want to submit, huh? We'll make you wish you had have carried it. So they had to carry it to their own death. So carrying your own cross is a way of saying that you're willing to lay your life down for Him if necessary. So two things Jesus taught here. Well, three things we got so far. You hear what He says and you put those words into practice. And then He goes on to say, you have to follow Him even if it means forsaking your family. And then He goes on to say, you have to follow Him even if it means laying down your life. Now, we don't probably have these problems in America, but you could imagine somewhere in the world this may still exist today. You might follow Jesus at the risk of your life or at the risk of losing your family. But if He means that much to you, and He should, then you're willing to give up everything, whatever it takes, to make Him your Lord. And by the way, making Him your Lord means that you submit to Him and everything that you own becomes His. Why does it mean that? Because He's your Lord and a Lord is an owner. He owns you. Does not the Bible say we were bought with a price? Verse 28 in uh, Luke, I think it was, he says, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Will he first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? So considering one may have to give up his family and possibly his life to follow Jesus, one might count that cost first. Well, am I willing to do this to follow Christ? Does he mean that much to me? If he really is who he said he was, he should. Because he has the words of eternal life. In John chapter 6, he preached a message that nobody could understand. Could you imagine? There's pastors that have thousands of people in their congregation. And could you? I've always looked at this verse and I thought, man, could you imagine somebody getting up there and saying this to 8,000 people and then coming back next Sunday and there ain't nobody there? That's gutsy. I don't think any of them would do it. But Jesus preached a message they couldn't understand. 5,000 people were there that day and listened to this man t say these things. When he was done, it said they left him and never followed him again. 
And he turned to the twelve that were with him and said, Will you also go away? And they said, Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. These twelve that he spoke to had given up everything to follow him. Jesus st or Peter still owned his boat in his house, but he made his boat a pulpit for Jesus to preach on. They gave up everything to follow this man Christ. Doing exactly what Jesus said to do. And when he preached a message that was too hard for the people to understand, the twelve said, where are we going to go? It wasn't too hard for them because they knew him. The other people were just there because they wanted fish and bread. They just wanted to eat from his table. They didn't want what he really had to offer. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the Word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does because he applies this Word to his life. It's not enough to simply hear what Jesus said. You've got to do what Jesus said. It's extremely important to know. If you don't know the Word of God, you're going to fall for anything. But if you don't do the Word of God, you're going to be guilty of not obeying it. The first thing you have to do is, is this what I want to do? And once you establish that, then you go from there. Proverbs says, in Proverbs 1 and 7, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What does it mean to fear the Lord? I'm going to borrow a quick example of what I heard somebody else say. I drive on the freeway every day, and I, I have no fear whatsoever of driving on the freeway. Okay? But if I get on the freeway and go on the wrong side and drive against the traffic, I'm petrified. If I go north in the southbound lane, I'm scared. And it's the same way with the Lord. If I'm going the direction He wants me to, do, to go, I don't need to be afraid. But if I go in the wrong direction, I need to be petrified. Because I know the result of what could happen by going the wrong direction. <clears throat> Romans 6.16 says, Do not, <clears throat> or Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey Him as slaves, you are slaves to the one to whom you obey? whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. So something is going to have mastery over us. It's either going to be sin or it's going to be God. As followers of Jesus, we're not perfect. We all fall short and sin. The difference is, as followers, we don't have to be slaves to the sin. Some don't want to follow Jesus because they think they'll lose their freedom. But the freedom that they think they're actually giving up is bondage. And becoming a servant of Jesus actually sets us free. Join with others, Philippians 3 says, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I often told you before and now, say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. How many of you know that exists today? Jesus has many enemies. Why does Jesus have so many enemies? Because he told the truth. You guys ever heard that old saying, if you lie to them, they'll love you? Haven't heard it? Okay. So anyway, people will believe the lies, but when you tell them the truth, it stirs up a lot of dissension. Because people don't want to hear the truth. Verse 19, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like His glorious body. In the resurrection. Remember, even Mary and Martha believed that. We just talked about or read about it a few minutes ago. So Moses told the people that God would raise up another prophet and that, they, and that the people should hear Him. This was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. 
Moses taught the people what God had given him. Jesus taught what, my, what his father taught him to say. He said, everything I told you is from my father. The apostles taught what Jesus taught them. And today we believe and teach what the apostles taught which comes from what Jesus taught, which comes from what His Father taught. So we can follow Paul's example because Paul followed Christ's example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, follow me or imitate me, depending on what translation you have, imitate or follow me as I follow Christ. So it's okay to follow them as long as they're going in the right direction because you're going with the flow of traffic. But if they don't follow Christ, you don't follow them. That makes sense? So in closing, we have to decide who we want to serve, sin or Jesus. And it doesn't take very long to see that applying the Scriptures to our lives actually works. And a great deal of wisdom can be gained by learning and following what the Bible says.